At some point, the ministry of Revive Our Hearts was introduced to you, maybe by a friend, a coworker, perhaps a pastor. Maybe you found us online or through social media or, or just through your car radio. And if you've been listening for any length of time, my guess is Revive Our Hearts has impacted you personally in some way. Our mission of helping women thrive in Christ is for you, and it's for her, too. We want to reach women of every age and stage with rich, applicable teaching of God's Word. I wonder if you're ready to make it personal for someone else today. When you become a Revive Partner, you're saying, I want this ministry to impact others just as I've been impacted. Revive Partners give $30 a month or more to invest in the work God is doing in the lives of women all around the world. Portia Collins is our Revive Partner Specialist, as well as a Revive Partner herself. She's here to tell us a little about what excites her about Revive Partners. One thing about our partners is they love Revive Our Hearts, and they express that in such beautiful and God-glorifying ways. And so to be the frontline person that sees that and experiences that, It's such an encouragement and a blessing to me. I've been fortunate to work in a variety of settings with um, people who give donors. And I can honestly say that I have never found a group of people who give like Revive Partners with such enthusiasm, with such encouragement to other people to become Revive Partners, and then also with such a testimony. There's a testimony behind practically every Revive Partner of how they have benefited from Revive Our Hearts resources or conferences. And I'm not just saying like surface level things, but I'm talking about seeing marriages be radically changed and seeing mamas who thought they couldn't pray enough for their prodigal child, like seeing them just be revived and hopeful, even in the midst of hard times. Like I just, I hear so much and I see so much with them and they are such an encouragement to me. And I am blessed to be able to serve them in this way. If you'd like to become part of our Revive Partner team and make a difference with your investment, you can find all the details at reviveourhearts.com slash partner. When you join this month, you'll receive a special welcome bundle that includes resources like finding the words to pray and incomparable 50 Days with Jesus by Nancy, plus the incomparable scripture card set and more. Again, visit reviveourhearts.com slash partner. We'd love to have you on our team. Nancy Damas Walgamuth points out an irony in the trial of Jesus. Well, there were many, many laws that were broken during Jesus' trial. And yet, isn't it amazing that Jesus still chose to die for lawbreakers? This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Choosing Forgiveness. For March 14th, 2024, I'm Dana Grash. Well, we've been in a rich study over the past few weeks called Incomparable. And I want to remind you, you can always go back and listen or catch up on any episodes at reviveourhearts.com or on the Revive Our Hearts app. Here's Nancy to continue in the series. Well, in the last session, we entered with Jesus into that very intimate scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, the oil press. And it was at the end of that time of prayer and surrender, submission, consecration, that Jesus was arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane around midnight, maybe the very, very early hours of the morning. And from that point, within less than 12 hours maybe as few as nine hours, Jesus went through both a Jewish trial and a Roman trial. He was declared guilty, he was sentenced to death, and he was crucified. It all happened very quickly. And sometimes we forget that when we're reading the gospel accounts and we have these lengthy chapters about the passion of Christ, and we forget that from the Garden of Gethsemane to his death on the cross was a very short period of time, just a matter of hours. 
Now, today, as we look at the trial of Christ, uh, which is, again, something that makes him incomparable, we'll see how he is, how there is no one else like him as we look at his trial, we often focus on the unspeakable physical torture that was inflicted on Jesus through the course of his trial. And if you've watched a movie like The Passion of the Christ, you've seen a depiction, very graphic, very vivid, of something of what the physical torture was like. Perhaps you've read descriptions of it as well. And uh, there's benefit in focusing on that. But I want us today to focus on the trial itself, on the legal aspects of the trial, and uh, what was unarguably the greatest travesty of justice in the history of the world. A gross, deliberate miscarriage of justice. But through it all, we're going to see that it had a purpose. And that even that trial, as unjust as it was, was a vital part of God's plan to rescue and redeem sinners. So we're going to have new eyes of gratitude that Jesus would not only have gone to the cross, but even preceding the cross, would have endured this trial on our behalf and why that matters. Now, you have to put all the four gospel accounts together to get the whole picture of Jesus' trial. And even then, it's not all clear what the exact sequence was and what all the details were. But we do know that both the Jewish trial and the Roman trial each had three stages, and we're going to uh, kind of walk through those stages of the trials over these next few moments. The Jewish trial, or the religious trial, began in the middle of the night after Jesus' arrest, and uh, the first part, the first stage of that trial was an informal examination by Annas, who was a former high priest. And then the second stage, Jesus was privately questioned by Caiaphas, who was the father-in-law of Annas and was the current high priest. Now, this was all a big family thing. Um, This was a dynasty, a high priestly dynasty that was not a godly dynasty at all. Uh, Caiaphas was the current high priest who had conspired with Judas to betray Christ. And then thirdly, after those preliminary meetings with Annas and with Caiaphas, Jesus was formally tried before members of the Sanhedrin, which had been hastily assembled in the wee hours of the morning. The Sanhedrin, as you may know, was the equivalent of the Jewish Supreme Court. It was composed of leading priests, teachers of the law, elders. It comprised 70 members plus the high priest. Uh, They only had to have 23 to have a quorum. So we don't know that all 70 were there for the trial of Jesus. There had to be at least 23. We don't know beyond that. Now, the Jewish legal system was based on the law of Moses, and it was well known for its commitment to justice and equity. Let me read for you, for example, a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 16 that describes God's heart for how the law was to be applied among his people. Deuteronomy 16, beginning in verse 18, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, right away, as soon as I read that passage, when you think of the trial of Jesus, you realize how it violated the Jewish legal system that God had given to them. For example, and we don't have time to read all the different accounts of the trial. There are many verses in Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, given to the trial of Jesus. But think about this passage in Matthew 26. It says, Now the chief priests and the whole council, that's the Sanhedrin, were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. Now, does that sound like it meets with the uh, direction in Deuteronomy 16? Not at all. This was uh, way out of line and way out of character for the way that the Jewish system was respected for functioning typically. The trial of Jesus before the Jewish religious authorities was a mockery of justice. It was a kangaroo court 
it violated virtually every legal procedure that had been put in place for how a trial of a man, a Jewish man, should take place. There was one illegality and one irregularity after another throughout the whole trial. Let me give you several examples, of which there are many. First of all, the arrest and the trial were conducted in the middle of the night, where according to Jewish law, trials had to take place during daytime hours. So the fact that they arrested him in the the middle of the night was a violation of their own Jewish law. Second, the trial was conducted in private rather than in public. Again, a violation of their law. Third, the trial was completed in less than one day, less than half a day actually, which was contrary to Jewish law. In Jewish law, a case that involved a capital offense had to take place over two days, could not be concluded until the following day to allow opportunity for witnesses to come forward to give the man a just trial. Jesus' trial violated Old Testament laws requiring that the defense be thoroughly investigated. Instead, they rushed to judgment and pronounced sentence as quickly as possible. And then in Jesus' trial, he was tried by partial judges as opposed to impartial, uh, members of the Sanhedrin who were known enemies of Jesus. It said in the passage we just read in Matthew 26, they were seeking to put him to death. They were not saying this man is innocent till proven guilty. They were convinced he was guilty. They had the end objective in mind before the trial even started, and they just pushed the trial to accomplish what their objective was, which was to put Jesus to death. So these were by no means impartial judges. And then Jesus was condemned on the basis of his own testimony, which was illegal according to Jewish law. Well, there were many, many laws that were broken during Jesus' trial, of which I've just named a few. And yet, isn't it amazing that Jesus still chose to die for lawbreakers? Even considering the fact that many laws were broken as he was en route to die for lawbreakers. I mean, it's ironic. It's amazing. It's astounding that he would have gone through this. Well, around dawn, having been through the Jewish um, mockery of a trial, a formal decision was made to put Jesus to death. However, the Jews could not carry out a death sentence without confirmation from the Roman authorities. And we know that from John chapter 18, verse 31 tells us that. So early in the morning, very early in the morning hours, they, according to Matthew 27, bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. The examination by Pilate was the first phase of the Roman trial. We saw the Jewish trial, now we have the the Roman trial, which also had three phases. Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Now, Romans didn't care about blasphemy, which is what the Jews had tried Jesus for. That was like, you know, that's your religion, whatever. So the Jewish leaders, when they took Jesus to Pilate, switched the charges from blasphemy to sedition, which was a Roman crime. To the Jews, it really didn't make any difference what the reason was. They just wanted Jesus dead. Trumped up charges, whatever it takes, whatever we've got to accuse him of, whatever false witnesses we have to bring in, we want him dead. Of course, we know as we study the Gospels that they were driven by pride, by greed, uh, greed for power, greed for place, for position. Scripture tells us they were driven by jealousy. Jesus was getting a following that they didn't have, and he was making them look bad to boot. Um, He was questioning, you know, calling them hypocrites and whitewashed sepulchers and pronouncing woes on them. And there was this jealousy. They were protecting their own interests, their hold, their control over the people. They were afraid they were going to lose control. This control that they had exerted over the people that put the people in bondage rather than being a liberating leadership. And so driven by all these ulterior motives, they just said, we want to get rid of him. And it's such a picture to me that as we think about the trial of Jesus 2,000 years ago, that some things never change. Still today, unbelieving lost sinners in this unbelieving lost world will go to almost any means and lengths to do away with Christ. 
They hate him because his purity exposes their sinfulness. His truth exposes their deception. His reign and right to rule, his authority dismantles their own authority and right to rule and be God over their own lives. And essentially the world says now as it did then, we will not have this man to rule over us. They just want him dead. And isn't it amazing today how other religions, some of them as kooky as the day is long, other religions in this world are respected, they are protected, you can't be politically correct and challenge some of their tenets. There's a, there's a real respect given for other religions of the world today. While at the same time, there is this concerted effort to do away with Jesus. And so today you can uh, talk freely about other religions and things that aren't true, but you start talking about Christ being the way, the truth, and the life, and you are going to be attacked. Not because they hate us, or if they do, they hate us because they hate Jesus. Well, Pilate's conclusion as he tried Jesus was simply, I find no guilt in this man. I don't see anything in him that is worthy of death. But the Jewish leaders, that was not an acceptable answer to them. They were insistent. Now, you imagine this is probably before 6 o'clock in the morning. So I don't know if they got Pilate out of bed or they just knew he started his day early. But this, I can just imagine Pilate thinking, what a headachey way to start this day. This, there's, you know, there's no reason for this man to die, but these people are bloodthirsty. They're determined to get rid of him. And the Jewish leaders were insistent that the man was a troublemaker and a threat to Caesar. Okay, now Pilate's ears are open. That matters to him. So when Pilate learned that Jesus was a Galilean from the northern district of Israel who belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he decided to send Jesus over to the court of the Galilean king named Herod, who happened to be in Jerusalem at the time, perhaps to help maintain order during the Passover season. Uh, but just a you know, across town there, there's Herod, and Jesus is under his jurisdiction. And I can imagine that Pilate was only too glad to get this messy case off of his hands. So we come to the second phase of the Roman trial, which is Jesus before Herod. Now, there are lots of different Herods, so this can get confusing. This was Herod Antipas, who was the king who had beheaded John the Baptist. He was the son of Herod the Great, who had ordered the slaughter of the Jewish infants 30 years earlier. So we see a legacy of violence and hatred and um, bizarre behavior at the best in this line of Herod. Now, Herod was glad to see Jesus. He'd heard a lot about him, but he'd never met him. And for a long time, he'd been wanting to see Jesus. The scripture tells us that he'd been hoping to see Jesus perform a miracle. So Herod questioned Jesus for some time, but as we'll see in the next session, Jesus would not answer any of Herod's questions. So finally, having mocked Jesus and treated him with contempt, Herod sent him back to Pilate for the third phase of the Roman trial and the final scene of this trial. And let me just read to you a couple of paragraphs here from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, to show us what happened next. And again, I know we're familiar with this, but as we come up to this Holy Week in the days ahead, it's good that we should meditate and ponder again what actually took place there. I'm beginning in verse 13 of Luke 23. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Pilate was right about that, wasn't he? Nothing deserving of death has been done by him. So Pilate says, verse 16, I will therefore punish and release him. Punish him, why? Not because Jesus was guilty of anything, but just to get this mess off his hands, hoping that would satisfy the Jews. But verse 18, they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. So here's Jesus who has done nothing wrong. 
and they're saying, we want him dead, but Barabbas, a man who is a known insurrectionist and murderer, we want him released. Let him go. Verse 20, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt-deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Now, as we consider this trial with all its illegalities and irregularities pushing uh, Jesus to judgment and execution, I want to just suggest several takeaways for our own hearts. First of all, those who betrayed, tried, and condemned Jesus were guilty of treason against the Holy One of God. They were guilty, both Jews and Romans. But here's what we need to remember. They were fulfilling a plan that God had ordained so that they could be redeemed from their sin. Go figure. Think about it. They were guilty. No excuse. They put Christ to death. They murdered the Holy One of God. But they were also fulfilling a plan that God had put into place in eternity past in order for them to be atoned for their sins. In Acts chapter 4, we read a prayer of the believers after Peter and John were released from prison. And this prayer, in this prayer, they quote from Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm. And they say, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Speaking of Jesus' trial. For truly in this city, this is in their prayer, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. That says that not for a moment were the Jews or the Romans in ultimate control of the matter. Even the wrath of men will praise God. Ultimately, ultimately, they were fulfilling a wise and loving and good plan of God for redemption. That should comfort us when we feel like the whole world's gone crazy and it's impacting us and we're being affected by it. Remember who's really in control and that God's plans will not be thwarted. He will accomplish his purposes, even if he has to use the wickedness of men to accomplish it. And then secondly, I see that Jesus' trial is a powerful apologetic for the fact that he was indeed sinless. If you ever wondered, his trial placed his innocence in the clearest possible light. Paul was preaching in Antioch years later. He says in Acts 13, And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Listen, Pilate was a seasoned governor. He knew how to know who was guilty and who wasn't. He knew Jesus was not guilty. And even in that secular pagan leader's assessment, we find the truth that Jesus was indeed sinless, if you've ever wondered. And then when those in authority sin against us, abuse their power, and lie, remembering Jesus before Herod, Pilate, and the Sanhedrin can comfort our souls. He's been there. He's experienced that. He did it for us. Which leads me to this really major point that the trial again points out the substitutionary nature of Christ's work in saving us. The Holy Son of God endured those trials, bogus as they were, as the representative of sinners. He stood there in our place, bearing our sins, on trial for our sins. In the book I've quoted earlier this week by um, F.W. Krumacher called The Suffering Savior, and again, such a rich book, you may want to get a hold of that. He says, the Lord stands before Herod, as he did before Annas, Caiaphas, and Pilate, not merely to be judged by men, but by God at the same time. And it is my sin for which he atones, and my debt, which he liquidates. He was standing there 
not only being judged by those human rulers, but being judged by God as the representative standing in my place, judged for my sins. And so a guilty man who deserves to die, namely Barabbas, is released. As are we released. And Jesus, who has done nothing deserving of death, is put to death in his place and ours. A picture of Jesus' substitutionary death in our place. In a message he gave on the trial of Jesus, Dr. John MacArthur says that as he considered the trial of Christ and the treatment he received, he said, I'm overwhelmed by his grace. I deserve the trial, the sentence, the condemnation, and the execution Christ undeservedly endured for me. It is God who should spit in my face, punch and slap me around, and then execute me. But Christ took my place. And that, my friends, is the gospel. That's the good news. An innocent man was tried and punished so that guilty men and women could go free. Well, that calls for a response from us. Every person has to take a position in relation to Jesus. And quoting again from my friend Krumacher, the suffering savior, he said, you see the alternative which is placed before you, either forever to break with Jesus and approve of the bloodthirsty sentence of the Sanhedrin, or to cry Hosanna to the lowly Nazarene and fall in humble adoration at his feet as God manifest in the flesh. There is here no middle path. How, therefore, do you decide? Worship him, bow before him, love him, trust him, or cry crucify him. No middle ground. And then just this reminder as we consider the trial of Christ, remember that at his earthly trial, Jesus was the judged one. But one day, the tables will be turned and he will be the supreme judge who will render righteous judgment. And if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, who died in your place for your sin, have placed your faith in him, then you have nothing to fear about that day when the righteous judge comes wielding his sword to vindicate all righteousness and judge all wrongs. You have nothing to fear. But if you have rejected Christ, have not believed in him, are not trusting him, or are trying to save yourself, then can I say you have everything to fear? when the righteous judge comes to pronounce righteous judgment. Oh, Father, how we thank you that Jesus endured this trial for us, for our sakes. He stood there in our place. And grant us, I pray, fresh eyes of faith to see, to believe, to repent, to receive what he has done in our place. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The trial of Jesus was a miscarriage of justice. Maybe you've heard that alluded to before, but Nancy's teaching today took us in depth, and the application for us is convicting. This entire series, Incomparable, well, it's all been like this, deep and rich. And as you've listened, I hope your understanding of the gospel story has been enriched. More than that, I hope you have been and will be encouraged to know and worship Jesus in a deeper way. Nancy? This series on the incomparable Christ has been such a blessing in my life. I've learned so much about Jesus that I never would have known if I hadn't dug into some of these passages and some of these topics. I'm so thankful for God's Word, and I'm thankful for the treasures that are available when we search God's Word. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to share it with others. One way you can share God's Word and the message of our incomparable Christ with others is through our new Incomparable Scripture card set. It contains 52 cards, one for each week of the year, and everyone has a Bible verse and a quote from Nancy, reminding you to set your mind on Jesus. He is more than we could ever imagine, and there is no one else like Him. 
You can put these cards in places around your house to remind you of these truths. You could share them with friends or leave them at restaurants for your waiters. The possibilities are endless. Get the incomparable scripture card set as our thanks when you support Revive Our Hearts with a gift of any amount this month. Our team designed this resource to accompany Nancy's new book, the same title of this series, Incomparable. If you don't have her book yet, you can also request it with your gift at reviveourhearts.com. Visit reviveourhearts.com to donate today or call us at 1-800-569-5959 and ask for the incomparable scripture card set or Nancy's new book. That's 1-800-569-5959. How do you react when someone accuses you of something? Most people defend themselves, but when he was accused, the response of Jesus was amazing. We'll talk about it tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts. This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts in Niles, Michigan, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.